so I'm Brian Herbst. I'm currently a uh, software engineer at Target working on our gift registry Android apps. Uh, and I'm here to take, talk today about the Android Toolbox, talking about the build tools that go into making our apps. Uh, we're going to look a little bit about where we've been, uh, and depending on how ahead of the curve you are, a little bit of where we're currently at or where you might be in a few months. So when I talk about the Android tools, what tools am I talking about? Well, if we uh, run the SDK Manager command line utility, we can see what exactly we can install from the Android tools. We can see that there's one called the Android SDK Tools. There's one called the Android SDK Platform Tools. And then there's one called Build Tools. And these are all very different things. Uh, the SDK Tools uh, are the things that are in the Tools directory in your Android home directory. These are tools like the Android uh, command line that uh, interacts with the Android SDK. Uh, there's the emulator, which is, of course, the emulator. There's also a monitor. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those. Those are boring. Uh, there's also the platform tools, like I said, and this contains tools like ADB, Fastboot, SysTrace, all useful utilities for interacting with Android devices, emulators, all that kind of stuff. Also, not what I'm going to talk about. What I'm actually going to talk about are the build tools, um, which are things like AAPT, APK Signer, uh, and DX. And you might notice that these are the only ones in your Android home directory that actually have a version associated with them. Uh, that's because as the Android, to the regular tools and the platform tools evolve, it, uh, it doesn't really change the way that you build your projects, and it doesn't really matter which versions of those you have on your machine. As long as you have something relatively up to date, they're going to work relatively well in mostly the same way. Whereas the build tools, because we might have multiple projects on our machines, and we want our builds to be reproducible, you want to make sure that you're using a very specific version of the build tools uh, when you're building your projects. So every time you install a new version of the build tools, unless you explicitly uninstall the old one, Android will still keep around all the old versions as well. And so when we talk about what we need to do to build our APK, first we have to actually talk about what's in an APK. And the first thing to know is that an APK is basically just a jar file. Uh, and a jar file is basically just a zip file. Uh, there's not actually that much special about jar files or APK files. Uh, if you really wanted to, you can actually just use your uh, operating system's built-in extraction utility to unzip your APKs and your jar files and see the files that go into them. Uh, and if you were to do this, uh, you'll see that there's a meta-inf file, which comes from the jar file format. It just contains a lot of metadata about your APK file, uh, particularly a manifest of the other files that are in there. There's a lib folder that contains all the native libraries that you might use in your application. So if you're using any uh, C++ or C native libraries in your app, this is where they go. You'll find that if you're doing that, you'll probably have an ARM folder, a, you know, a, a x86 folder, whatever else you're supporting. And now here's where it gets a little bit complicated, so bear with me for a minute. There's a res folder, which contains only your static resources. These are things like PNGs, XML layouts, things that we can't really compile down into any other format. And then there's an assets folder, which is uh, similarly, it's a bunch of resources, but it's your static assets, things that are fonts, HTML, that kind of stuff, things that aren't Android resources per se, but are uh, assets that you might want to reference in your code. Uh, of course, there's the Android manifest, which I hope looks pretty familiar if you're an Android developer. Uh, not much to say about that one. And then there's the classes.dex file, which if, you, if I was giving this talk about five years ago, I'd tell you that this is the one and only classes.dex file in your APK, and it contains every last line of code that goes into your app. Uh, that's no longer true. Uh, I'm sure many of us have run into the 65K method limit of the dex file format already. Uh, so it's very likely that you're using multi-dex or some other tool like that, and you now have a classes1.dex, classes2.dex, all that kind of stuff. But in either way, you'll have dex files that contain all of your code. And then the last kind of component of this resources complexity is a resources.arsc file, which contains a bunch of compiled resources. So these are things like strings, dimensions, and colors that the XML format that you probably write them in is not super efficient. And uh, Android, the Android build tools can actually compile it down into a much more efficient way, uh, storage manner to actually ship on in the APK. So I said that all your code is in DEX files. And you might be saying, well, hold on a second. I don't remember writing any DEX code. And you are right. You probably don't, because no one actually wants to write in the DEX file format. Uh, but if we take a step back and we talk about how code works in general, we write in a language. Uh, so for example, with C, we write our C code. And then we somehow have to run that on our machines, which speak machine code. And so in the world of C, we compile it straight to machine code and run it on the device. Uh, the, this gets a little bit more complicated with different types of processors and different architectures because we have to compile our C code for each and every architecture that we support. So x86, ARM, MIPS, uh, you know, depending on how much you want to uh, spread out your app, you might have to have a lot of different versions of your app available. 
it's probably familiar to most of us, but we'll get to where this becomes interesting in a little bit. Um, Java is different. The Java said, this is silly. We don't want to recompile our code every, for every new architecture that comes about. So Java has uh, .class files, which have Java bytecode in them. And then whatever machine we're running on is responsible for interpreting that Java bytecode as machine code. And so the Java, Java file to class file conversion is generally done ahead of time on our developer machines. And then the class to machine code conversion is done on somebody else's machine, usually just in time as you're running the app. Android decided that wasn't complicated enough. Uh, and so they added one more step in the process, which is the, class, uh, the Java bytecode to dex bytecode uh, step, which again is done on our developer machines, not on devices. And then on the Android devices with Delvic, those dex files are generally read just in time into machine code. And then around Android 5.0 came along with uh, the Android runtime, which is a replacement for the Delvic runtime. And that actually does ahead of time compilation on your device with some JIT. So what that means, and we'll look at this a little bit later again, um, but what that means is that we're installing our apps with all the dex code. And then Art is at install time, doing some optimization, some ahead of time compiling on the device into machine code, and then leaving some of it still around to be interpreted later when you actually run the app. So when we talk about building our APK, we're going to kind of separate it out into three main phases. There's the comp compilation phase, transformation, and then the packaging phase. And this is kind of a gross uh, over oversimplification of this, but in general, the compilation phase is our Java files going to class files. Transform is going to be class to dex. And then packaging is going to get all the stuff into our APK. And I hope one thing that you kind of see as a trend as I talk about the tools and how they've evolved is there's been a shift, especially in the last, uh, I'd say, two years or so, from using very generic tools that are uh, general purpose, mostly Java tools, to more Android-specific tools that are more suited for what we need as Android developers and for what Android as a uh, system needs. Another thing that the uh, tools teams have been doing a lot of work on, especially in the last two years, is making the tools more incremental when they build and supporting better parallelism so that our builds are significantly faster and more efficient. So we have a lot of command line tools that we interact with and we as developers probably don't want to be actually interacting with them very much for a lot of reasons. First of all, uh, there's probably about a dozen tools that go into actually crafting our APKs and the chances of you remembering all of the little intricacies of the flags and the arguments for each of those commands is pretty low. And the chances of any other developers on your team using the exact same invocations of those commands is even lower. So we oftentimes use a build tool, most of us probably using Gradle, to kind of orchestrate all of that together. And by default, Gradle doesn't actually do anything. If you put a build.gradle file in your project, uh, you now have a Gradle project, congratulations, but it won't do anything. Uh, so the way we add functionality to Gradle is by using plugins. The one that most of us are probably familiar with is the Android plugin which gives us all the Android functionality we need to build Android apps. Uh, a lot of us are probably familiar with the Java plugin. And then if you're ahead of the curve, you might be using the Kotlin plugin. And these are all just different ways of telling Gradle, hey, my project is interested in building these types of things. Please provide that functionality for me. And so the way that plugins do that is they extend the Gradle DSL. So uh, in the case of Android, that Android block where you configure all of your Android properties, things like the minimum SDK version, target SDK version, all that mumbo jumbo, uh, that's, the D, that's the DSL that we're using to uh, configure Gradle, and the Android plugin offers that for us. Plugins also add dependency configurations is the term that Gradle uses, which I think is an awful term for this. Uh, yes. Uh, domain specific language. Uh, so Gradle calls these configurations. I think that's an awful name for them, but it's basically different ways of including dependencies in your builds. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but things like the compile configuration or runtime only configuration. And then the a third kind of main way that uh, most plugins offer functionality is through tasks. Things like assemble debug, uh, install debug, all the tasks that you actually do to run your build and execute tasks using Gradle. So if you haven't already started using the Android plugin 3.x and Gradle 4.x, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, these are kind of the last big milestones that they released uh, about six months ago now. And they've provided some incredible, um, new, uh, incredibly faster builds and some great new features. And so I mentioned configurations before. Most of us are probably familiar with the compile configuration, maybe test compile for test dependencies, debug compile for any dependencies you only want in your debug builds. Uh, the APK dependency provided, all those are gone. Uh, 
the new ones are uh, the main new one is or one of the main new ones is API. API is basically the old compile configuration. This just means it's that your dependency is available both at compile time and at runtime. It's available everywhere all the time. End of story. The other new one that you probably care about is implementation. This is where the updates to Gradle and the Android plugin get really interesting because implementation dependencies are available at compile time to your module, but only available to consumers of your modules at runtime. And we'll see where this gets to be helpful in a second. But uh, kind of like we had before, you can still do compile only, runtime only, pretty straightforward. Either the dependency is only available when you compile or only available when you actually run the app. But let's get back to that implementation dependency. So previously, if we, did a, if we had an app module that relies on a library A module that relies on a library B module, and that library A has a compiled dependency on library B, if we make one change to the external API of library B, library A, of course, has to recompile. And even if the app module isn't using anything from library B, it still has to recompile because library B is leaking that interface into uh, the app, or library A is leaking library B into the app module. So now we can use the implementation dependency. And when library B, we make an uh, external interface change there, library A still has to recompile, but our app module no longer has to recompile because library B is no longer leaking its interface to our app module. And this, this example is pretty small, right? You're only saving one recompilation here. But first of all, your app module is probably your biggest module. And if you are using a large multi-module project, you can see how this kind of cascades throughout the entire uh, dependency hierarchy of your app. Uh, if you're curious about numbers, I think uh, Google is doing a test project that with Gradle 2.2 and the Android plugin 2. something, uh, they, this particular project took about two minutes and 15 seconds to compile a one-line Java change. And when they updated to the 3.0, 4.0 uh, combination, it went down to something like six seconds. Uh, and the other thing I'd say is that if you're currently using Buck or, uh, sorry, Buck or Basil to do your builds because of multi-module configurations like that, it's probably worth taking a look at the official plugins again, just because A, you're gonna get much better support from Google for it, and B, the performance should be pretty close to on par at this point. There's also a lot more stuff that they've done in the latest versions of the plugins that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, but at a high level, there's a lot more uh, incremental, incremental build support, a lot more parallel support. Uh, they primarily did that by making the task graph much more fine-grained. So whereas they used to have large tasks that did a lot of stuff at once, a lot of those tasks are now smaller chunks that you can uh, spin off on different threads and get much faster builds that way. All right, so I said the first big phase of our building our APK was the compilation step. This is also the most boring step. Uh, before we compile, of course, though, we need to do some code generation if we have any code generation libraries. Uh, so dagger, butter knife, data binding, all those have to do uh, code generation before we can actually compile our class files, of course. Other ones you might not have thought about before that you also have to generate. Uh, if you're using build config fields in your Gradle build, those have to be generated right now. Uh, res value, same thing, those have to be generated. Pretty boring. And then we invoke either Java C or Kotlin C to compile our code, and then we're done. Transforms is, I think, probably one of the most interesting steps of the build process. Um, and if you dive into the Gradle Android plugins code, uh, there's almost all of it is centered around the idea of these transforms and what's going on there. And so when I talk about transforms, what do I mean? Well, so one thing that we might want to transform is we want, might want to be writing our code in Java 8, get all these nice fun, uh, language features like Lambda functions, but the Android devices we're running on typically only support you know, Java 6 or 7 bytecode. So one transform we might be interested in is something that transforms our Java 8 bytecode into Java 6 or 7 bytecode. Similarly, we might want to transform our regular Java bytecode into some form of optimized bytecode, uh, either uh, optimized in the traditional sense of getting rid of redundant statements, stuff like that, uh, but also shrunk and obfuscated bytecode. And then finally, of course, we want to transform our Java bytecode to Dex bytecode so Android devices can actually run it. This is actually all centered around a API in the Gradle plugin called the transform interface. And if you haven't looked at this yet already, you can actually uh, pull the Gradle API, in, or the Android Gradle plugins API into your own projects. And you can write your own transforms if you're interested in doing so. And some of you guys might be familiar with Retro Lambda, which actually does exactly this. If you have Retro Lambda in your builds, there is a Retro Lambda transform that extends this uh, transform in interface. And that's how Retro Lambda takes lambdas and turns them into Java 6 and 7 compatible bytecode. If you want to see what transforms are running in your app, 
Uh, I promise you, you have at least a dozen of them already. Uh, if you go into your build folder and you look in the transforms directory, um, there's a whole bunch of them there. Usually you'll have some Dex transforms. You'll have merge Java resources transform that merges all your resources together. Uh, there's a ProGuard transform if you're using ProGuard. And one that I found by doing this that I thought was really interesting is there's this transform called the Profilers transform. And it turns out this Profilers transform is how Android Studio does its profiling in your app now. Uh, you might not know this, but the Grail plugin is in, uh, instrumenting your application for you by injecting this transform that uh, instruments your bytecode during the compilation phase or during the uh, during your Gradle builds, and then that connects to Android Studio and lets them do all that fancy network monitoring, CPU monitoring, and memory monitoring. So that's pretty cool. All right, so we want to get our class files to DEX files. The two tools that we can use to do this are DX and, if you're really fancy, D8. So DX is the current DEXing tool. It's a uh, command line utility that you can run. It's in that build tools directory. Uh, if you want to run it, it's pretty simple. It's just DX pass it the classes you want to do, and then it's going to compile all that into a classes.dex file. You don't get to choose what it's called. It's going to be called classes.dex. Uh, and then you can also, if you want to see what's actually inside of that, there's a tool in the build tools called dex dump that disassembles dex files, just like you can use Java P to disassemble Java files. If we do that, we'll see something that looks a lot like this. And I'm not going to talk any about the bytecode at all, because if you're really interested in bytecode, Jake Horton gave a fantastic talk called Sinking Your Teeth into Bytecode that talks a lot about what your bytecode is doing in these transform steps, uh, what bytecode means, uh, and he also goes into depth about what Kotlin does with your bytecode versus what Java does with your bytecode. So if you're curious about bytecode, definitely check that talk out. Uh, but where this gets more interesting is when we talk about D8, which is the next generation texting tool. Uh, but you probably aren't using it yet, but you can. Uh, D8 gives us faster compilation. That's one of the main benefits of rewriting the texting tool. Uh, it also generates smaller DEX files, so it generates much more efficient DEX files for us. And we'll come back to this in a little bit, but it also brings R8 integration. Um, and it's about all I'm going to say about D8 right now, because it's kind of going to slip into a lot of the other uh, transforms that we're going to be talking about here. But if you, are, if you want to try this out on your builds, you can actually go into your gradle.properties file and just throw an android.enableD8 equals true, and you can use D8 today as long as you're using, I think it's a Gradle plugin 3.0 and above. It will be the default in uh, Android Studio and Gradle plugin 3.1, though, which I'm guessing is going to be released pretty soon here. Um, they've been getting, I think they're in beta now, so I'd expect probably in the next month or two to see 3.1 uh, become public, and then you'll probably be using D8. So DSugar. Uh, I mentioned before that we might want to be using Java 8 language features, even though none of our Android devices actually support Java 8. So a lot of us in the past probably used Retro Lambda to do that. Uh, Retro Lambda is not really uh, the right option anymore. If you were really fancy for just a little while, you might have been using Jack. Uh, don't use Jack. <laughs> uh, if you, right now, if you uh, want to use Java 8 language features and you're using 3.0 of the Gradle plugin, the Gradle plugin actually has a uh, transform called dsugar built into it right now, and it'll do more than just Lambda functions. You can do a little bit more of the Java 8 language features, uh, but that's also going away because D8 is going to actually take over all of that for you. And the main benefit to D8 taking over a lot of this stuff is that it can do all the, it can do your uh, compilation and that desugaring all in one step. It's a lot, by taking out steps, obviously it's going to go faster, become a little bit more efficient, et cetera. So I mentioned Jack very briefly before. Jack and Jill, dead tools, don't use them. The overall concept was actually pretty similar to D8, where they were trying to take a lot of the steps of compiling your code into an APK and bring it all under the same tools, uh, but they ended up uh, abandoning those tools for D8 and R8. So if you're still using them, just please stop. <laughs> all right, so the next thing I talked about was um, optimiz optimizing your code, and also along with that, shrinking and obfuscating your code. And most of us are probably familiar, maybe dread the name ProGuard, and maybe you're curious about what this new R8 thing is. So when I talk about shrinking and obfuscating, what does that mean? Well. If we have an activity that references two different classes, and then I stop referencing one of those classes, but I leave it around in my code, ProGuard can come in and say, hey, class B, no longer used. We don't care about it. We'll just strip it out. We can also obfuscate our code so that, class A, or so that our activity in class A just become A and B. And this is actually pretty useful uh, even if, so some people do this for security reasons. 
it's probably not really a good reason to do it because uh, even if your code doesn't look very codish, if it's just a bunch of A's and B's and C's and D's, uh, you can still kind of figure out what it is, right? Like we've all looked at code that doesn't make any sense to begin with. And if you look at it long enough, you can figure out what's going on. It's not really a security feature. Um, but one thing that people kind of don't think about that actually is helpful is that this actually helps shrink your code as well because you're taking your maybe really long Java class names and compiling it down to just one or two letters. So ProGuard is the old tool that most, most of us are probably still using for uh, shrinking obfuscation. And we probably don't realize it, but it does actually do some optimization as well. And the key is that ProGuard is an open source. It's an open source project uh, from a company called GuardSquare. For some reason, GuardSquare really wants me to switch to DexGuard, uh, which does whole program uh, shrinking and obfuscation, but they do ProGuard as well. And it's a shrinker obfuscation optimization tool, like I said. Command line utility shipped in the build tools. And if you want to use ProGuard if you're not already, you just turn minify enabled to true in your, uh, man, or in your build.gradle file. Again, I don't know who comes up with these names, but minify enabled to do minification, obfuscation, and optimization. A little bit silly. And then if you want to customize ProGuard, you can specify a ProGuard rules file uh, that contains a whole bunch of rules about what you want ProGuard to do and what you don't want it to do. So for example, if you've got this model class called important data, maybe this comes from the API, maybe you're using something like JSON to deserialize it. You probably don't want ProGuard to come along and rename the name of the class, rename all the fields, uh, because then you, it won't deserialize the JSON. So you can add a keep rule like this to tell ProGuard, hey, just leave my important data alone. I don't want you touching it. A lot of us might also do this for views. If we write custom views, we obviously don't want ProGuard to come along and strip that out because when we reference them in our layout files, we're referencing them with a very specific class name. And if that class name changes, then all of a sudden we're not going to be able to reference them anymore. Turns out you don't have to do that because AAPT, which we'll talk about soon, the Android Asset Packaging Tool, automatically generates ProGuard rules for all of your activities, for all of your views, all of your services, all of your content providers, and all of your broadcast receivers. So you don't have to generate ProGuard rules for any of those things yourself. All right, so I said that ProGuard is an open source Java shrinker, obfuscation, and optimization tool. Well, the key here is actually that it's a Java shrinker, obfuscation, optimization tool. What that means is that this is a tool designed for Java applications, and it doesn't know anything about any Android stuff that you're writing. So where this becomes problematic is if we have an activity that references you know, a whole bunch of code, and then we have this drawable off to the side. This drawable isn't referenced by anything, and ProGuard doesn't know, and ProGuard doesn't care. So now we have this drawable in our code that uh, is taking up space in our APKs. No one's using it, and we can't really strip it out. Right now, the Gradle plugin does do some uh, resource shrinking itself, but ProGuard can't do this, and there's a limit on how much the Gradle plugin can actually do there. Similarly, if we have a drawable that references a Java class, ProGuard can't do anything there, right? ProGuard will actually probably strip out or shrink that class because it doesn't know that anything is referencing it. So this is also a problem. So that's where a tool called R8 starts to come into play. R8 is actually, D8 and R8 are in the same project. R8 is kind of a superset of D8. It's a little bit complicated, bear with me. Um, and R8 does everything that D8 does, and then also does some of the shrinking, obfuscation, optimization that we're to, used to ProGuard doing. So it also does D8. <laughs> and R8 does full program shrinking, obfuscation, and optimization. And what that means is that R8 can actually look at our drawables, all of our Android resources, all that stuff, and shrink and obfuscate those as well as our Java code. R8 also has much better incremental support. And it, they've promised that they're working on a new DSL for uh, the keep rules. Uh, right now, you can just use the same ProGuard rules that you've been using forever. Um, but they've, they've promised that they're working on something a little bit newer, a little bit more modern, a little bit easier to work with. Sadly, R8 is not available yet, even in preview form. If you really are interested in R8, you can check out the repo. It is open source. Uh, actually downloading it and running R8 is a bit of a pain in the butt, but it is possible if you are really, really curious. So then the last step of making our APK is packaging the APK. We got to get all of the code, all of our resources into the APK file for final release. I've mentioned AAPT a few times. That's the Android Asset Packaging Tool. And kind of the high level summary of AAPT is misleading, but it packages, reads, and updates our APKs. But it also does a whole crap ton of other things. It processes our resources, so it'll go through all of our drawables, all of our layout files, and process those. 
It generates that R class that we all use in our code. And it also compiles all of those resources that I said go into that resources.arsc file on our APK. Uh, so really, while I'm talking about AAPT and the packaging step, kind of has a hand in every single step of the build process for Android. And then I think a year and a half ago, two years ago now, uh, they came out with AAPT2, which uh, probably unsurprisingly stands for Android Asset Packaging Tool 2. And that was enabled by default in plugin 3.0. So you're probably already using it if you're using plugin 3.0. Using an older version, you can still enable it in preview form if you're using a more relatively recent version. Uh, but I just go to plugin 3.0, you'll like everything a lot better, and you'll get AAPT2. And the biggest win that APT2 brought is that it split the linking and the compilation phases of packaging your resources, uh, which brings about better increment incrementality, better parallelism, all that fun stuff. The one thing to note about AAPT2 is that it's also a lot more restrictive about what it'll accept. So as an example, if you have your manifest file that has an activity element, and you've got an action element that's not in an intent filter, if you're not aware, your actions have to be in intent filters, AAPT1 would be just fine with you doing this. It would just ignore it, and it wouldn't really do anything, but it, would, it wouldn't crash. Uh, APT2 will actually say, hey, you can't do that. You won't be able to build. Um, so if you switch to APT2, you might notice a few things like this. Google has some great documentation on the changes for AAPT2, what's more restrictive. Um, so if you, get into, if you get stuck there, you can always check out their documentation and it'll probably get your build working again. All right, so we have everything in an APK. We can't release it quite yet though. There's a few steps we need to go through first. And the first one is actually signing our APK. Uh, and the thing that APK signing is trying to address is the fact that I can, if I steal Teo's password, I can log into his account on the Google Play Developer Council and theoretically upload an APK in his name. So APK signing does two things. First, it addresses that gap by saying, hey, I actually made this build. I'm signing with my key. So even though it's my account uploading it, now you know for sure it was me. And then on the device, the device can also do that same verification saying, hey, the signature matches the same signature of the app that's already on my device. So I can probably trust that it is built by the same person and not a malicious app that's trying to replace an existing app. So there are two versions of APK signature that you might see in use. Uh, V1 signatures use jar signer, which is, as you might be able to guess, a pretty generic purpose Java uh, jar signing utility. And the jar signer actually signs the entries of your jar, not the jar itself. V2 signatures use a tool called APK signer, which is a more Android specific tool. And this is actually a full file signature. So APK signer takes your entire APK, breaks it up into chunks, digests those chunks, and then signs the APK file as a whole. So the problem with jar signer was that when your device went to go actually verify the APKs, first it had to verify a lot of uh, content, or it had to process a lot of content that it hadn't verified yet in order to do the verification. And uh, it also had to um, uncompress the entire APK before it could do the signing. With uh, V2 signatures, your device can do all of that without, can, can eliminate a lot of those steps and do a lot more efficiently and a lot more securely. Uh, so if you're using Gradle plugin 2.2 and above, which I really hope you guys are all using at least 2.2, uh, then it'll actually default to V2 signatures. It will still also sign your apps with V1 signatures because uh, Android 5.0, I believe, was or no, Android 7.0 was the first version of Android to actually read V2 signatures by default. So everything older than that will just ignore the V2 signature and look for that V1 signature inside of the app. And then the final step that we need to do to our APK is zip aligning it. And you might be familiar with the zip align tool, but you might not be sure what exactly it's doing. Because the description of zip align is that it aligns your APKs on a four byte boundary. You might be like, well, why the heck do we care about that? Well, if we go back to some computer science 101, we got our memory on our left, we got our CPU on the right, and our CPU only thinks in sets of four bytes. And on our, we got uh, two, two four byte groups of data on, in the memory on the left. So if we want to load some data and it's aligned on the, those four byte boundaries, well, it's a pretty simple operation. We just copy it over to our, our processor and we're ready to go. Now, if we have unaligned data, so in this case, we have data that crosses that four byte boundary in order to load it into our processor, we actually have to do a whole bunch of extra steps. We have to copy both four byte segments into the processor. We have to shift top one up, bottom one down, and then we can copy it over. 
So this is like, you know, three or four extra steps that we don't, that we would have, wouldn't have had to have done if all of our data was aligned in the first place. So while this comes at a slight cost to the size of our APKs, it comes at a significant benefit to when we're actually running our apps. It just works a lot more efficiently on the device. And then one thing to remember about ZipLine, if you're signing things yourself and lining things yourself, is that if you're using a V1 signature, you have to zip line after you're, signing, after you're done signing it. And if you're using a V2 signature, you need to zip line before signing. And if you think about the way V2 signatures work, this makes a lot of sense because if V2 signatures are signing the entire file and then you go and you realign everything in the file, that signature is no longer valid. And as I was crafting this talk, uh, I was going through a lot of the Android Gradle plugin source and I kept coming across this thing called APK Zlib. And as it turns out, almost everything I just talked about in the packaging step is not actually applicable if you're using the Gradle plugin. So I talked about packaging tools like AAPT, ZipLine, and APK Signer. It turns out the Gradle plugin decided that those, using those in individual uh, tools isn't very efficient. So they kind of recreated all of this in a library called APK Zlib. And uh, while you don't, might, we aren't using the APK signer tools directly, a lot of the stuff is still relevant because you're still doing the same processes, just with a different, slightly different library. And APK Zlib actually behind the scenes uses the same libraries as AAPT, ZipLine, and APK signer in some cases. Uh, so you're still using with more or less the same code. And APK Zlib, uh, in a high level summary, uh, is just a Java library that does a lot of those uh, steps for you. It also doesn't makes it more efficient by doing a lot of the steps at the same time. So for example, they can sign and align all of your Dex file or um, all of your APK files at the same time. All right, and then as a little extra treat, we're gonna talk a little bit about what happens after you build your APK and run it on a device. And specifically, we're gonna be looking at the Android runtime, which most of our devices are probably running by now. And so if we go back to the beginning of the talk, I said that uh, the, Java, the uh, Java code to bytecode conversion is done ahead of time on your computer. And then we also compile the DEX files on your computer. But then that DEX to machine code conversion is done on the device ahead of time. And there's a little bit of just-in-time compilation as well. And so we install our APK on the device. And then the uh, ARC will run this tool called DEX to OAT. To, opt, to create an optimized version of our APKs that contains both DEX files and OAT files, which stands for uh, of ahead time. Uh, fun fact, uh, Jesse Wilson says that they're called OAT files because then you can call the process of going from DEX to OAT Quakerizing. So DEX to OAT will go ahead and create your of ahead time compiled files. And then when you run your app, uh, as you're running your app on the device, uh, Art is actually continuously making a just-in-time compilation profile of how users are interacting with their app, what methods are being called, all that kind of stuff. And then it outputs that and then runs Dex to OAT on that output to make an even more optimized OAT file, which it'll then recompile into your APK for future runs. Art was originally introduced in Android 5.0 with basically just the Dex to OAT tool and not the JIT profiling. And then Android 7.0 Nougat brought about the JIT profiling and the extra OAT um, optimization after the profiling. So what that means at the end of the day is that if you are looking at your methods that are running on the device, they're usually in one of three states. They can be directly interpreted uh, from DEX files. This is the JIT compilation. Or this is, yeah, so, and then they can be already JIT compiled. So we already ran that method, it was already compiled. So they're in memory. Or they can be of ahead, ahead of time compiled in your OAT files. Uh, JIT, filed, or JIT compiled is actually the best case scenario because it's already in memory. Uh, Ahead of time compiled is the second best. Then DEX interpreted is probably the worst case because then there's a lot of extra steps you have to go through. Uh, so if you're curious about learning more about this, I definitely recommend checking out the Android plugins uh, source. It's in the absolute mess of a repository known as Platform Tools Base. Uh, I'm sorry for anyone who does want to go check it out and look through the Google source. Uh, almost all of their repositories are kind of giant messes. Uh, if you want to hear more about art and APK signing, source.android.com has some absolutely phenomenal resources that I think most people don't know exist on how art works, how Delvic worked, uh, and how APK signing works, all that kind of stuff. And then R8 and D8, probably the two coolest two new tools that are coming to Android. Um, the source code is at r8.googlesource.com. Again, it's kind of a pain in the ass if you want to actually run it, um, but it is available to look at. 
And uh, the Android Developers Backstage podcast actually just did a talk on it as well. Um, so I think it was last week. So check out that episode as well. And if you want to see my slides, uh, they're posted there already. Um, and I'll probably tweet them out shortly after this talk. And that's all I have. If you have questions, you can come talk to me afterwards.